What comes to your mind when you hear Cape Canaveral? Perhaps you think of early explorers sailing off the coast of Florida in search of a new frontier. Maybe your thoughts recall space exploration and our first seven heroic astronauts that led Americans in the space race. Nowadays, you might think of cruise ships departing for an ocean adventure to a tropical paradise. Cape Canaveral. This is where we grew up. This is where we work. This is where we live. This historical presentation comes from the memories of its early residents. These are individuals who have seen and experienced the birth and growth of a small city. A city that takes great pride in its sun, space, and sea. Our story begins as many small communities developed along the Indian and Banana Rivers on Florida's east coast. These early settlers lived in the grueling Florida heat and fought off the swarming Florida mosquitoes. They survived by working the land and harvesting sea life in the surrounding inland waterways. Now let's meet some of the early residents. My grandparents came here in 1879. So they, they cleared a lot of uh, the roads here originally and this wagon trucks, trucks really. And then my mother and dad came back up here in 1918 and, uh, and I was born here in 22. We grew up as commercial fishermen. My dad came from South Dakota, came down here in 1900, married my mother, and uh, they had six children. I was the last one. It was uh, hard on them. Raising six children during the Depression wasn't easy. My grandfather, he came down from South Carolina in 1893 to move the lighthouse. And my grandmother was a, a Burnham, so she goes with a, a quarterman who was a Burnham. So he, her whole family comes from a series of lighthouse keepers. Well, the early years in Cape Canaveral were quite enjoyable for a, a five-year-old, which is how old I was when I came here. And the reason I, I came, my mother remarried George Chandler who was born and raised in Cape Canaveral in 1903. And so that was 1937, the year before I went to grade school. Probably the closest kid was uh, Flossie, which was about a mile away. My grandparents settled in this area in the late 1800s. My grandfather became a farmer. My grandmother was postmaster. The, that is the beginning of the everyone clan because they got married after that and they produced my mother and two brothers. That's how the everyone family began over here. I came to Cape Canaveral, which was then Artesia, in July of 1932 because I was born here. I was a single child and I was left alone a great deal of the time because my mother was postmaster and I kind of raised myself. I had a boat and I was in my boat from the early morning till late at night. One of the people who lived not too far from me for a number of years uh, was Ira Hill. Dad got a job with the Molar Mower and Ohio Dredging Company that dredged in the Red River Naval Air Station. I had a brother that was two years younger than me. You know, we just play around in the woods out there. Uh, you grew up in a hurry around here, and you learn how to use guns, how to fish with cast nets, everything. You survived off a lot of mullet. You used to catch those. Everybody had a cast net, and uh, I don't think I ever seen anybody with a rod and reel or anything like that. Well, my grandfather came from Germany and he stayed in Chicago. And my Uncle Otto, my grandfather's brother, came to Cape Canaveral. Well, my mother was an Everwine. And as I say, she come down from Chicago to see Uncle Otto. And that's where she met my father. My mother ended up marrying my dad and they moved, she moved down here. Then my aunt ended up, my mother's sister moved down here and her brother moved down here. And so we had the whole family down here. Well, when they first got here, my grandfather went to work on the Banana River Wooden Bridge as toll master. And my Uncle Otto, he had orange groves down here. And where the port's at now was all orange groves that belonged to him. I was born in 31, Angel City. 
There was 21 crews of fish, fishermen in Banana River at Angel, Angel City and here in Port uh, Cape Canaveral and Artesia and some, a couple from Cocoa Beach. All these families were fishing out there at one time and that, that was four or five guys to each crew. There was a lot of fish in those days. You could go out and, and uh, get three or four thousand pounds of fish real easy in, in a couple hours. Well, the boats in the river weren't that big and most of them were skiffs with their fishing nets on the back of them. Well, there wasn't any way to get to the ocean. There wasn't any inlet back then, but they would fish in Banana River, Bukuza fish back then. But the biggest fish in there was mullet, and they were delicious. <laughs> we used to have fun out there at the old pier that used to be out there. And my dad had his shrimp boats out there. He sold his fish business to Fisher Seafoods. It's right on the tip, if you, if you look at the, the map, right on the tip of the Cape. And there was a pier that looks very much like the Cocoa Beach Pier is built today. It was where they brought in the commercial fish and uh, shrimp. And they would head the shrimp, break the heads off, and then they would pack them in ice and haul them out. Had a huge building on it, you know, where they done headed the shrimp. And there was one place there that had the cottages that everybody could live in, you know, if you worked there. And then there was houses all around, you know, and then there was a place that they had a restaurant, and there was a hotel there. There must have been about 12 rooms in that hotel. And then there was a bar, and there was a dance hall, a dance floor, and there was a uh, dining room. And they had, a, they had the only electric on the Cape at that time because they had a generator. And the, when the pier was put in out there, it also had electric, it had a generator. There was no, no electric out here. It was a community, there was a little uh, broom factory up there. They made brooms out of the switchgrass. That was probably the first industry in, <laughs> in Cape Canaveral. Well, that picked up the mail and delivered it all along the docks, along the river. All, all the people practically lived along the river here because there was no transportation, there was no cars. Of course, mail was a big thing, and my uncle used to operate a mail boat and before the bridges were put in. And uh, where I live right now was my uh, mother's parents homesteaded there. And that was uh, Lotus on Merritt Island, and that, that was a mailboat stop. And my, my grandmother was the postmistress. Kid Theodore told me that back then, when he delivered mail on the, on the mailboat, that they had two deliveries a day. You went out in the dock in the morning, put your grocery list, put your mail in the little box, and the mailman picked it up, got your grocery list, and did your shopping for you, and brought it back in the evening. Our house initially uh, didn't have indoor plumbing. We had an outhouse, didn't have telephone, didn't have electricity. When I was 12 years old, we got electricity over here. But up until that time, I had done lessons and things by kerosene light. We had surface pumps. We had uh, old hand pumps, you know, for, for water. So when you when you caught fish back then or caught the game, if you had if you had too much, if you caught too much, you shared it with your neighbors. You didn't just throw it away. The times were tough, and uh, but it was it was it was a lot of camaraderie. You know, people got along good together. They worked hard together. Everyone respected one another. There weren't too many locks on doors. You lend a helping hand. And the people that had lived in Cape Canaveral, like the Everwines, they had been through the Depression just like the Ghouls had. And they made do. It, it wasn't like it is now where the kids have dishwashers and TVs and, you know, all these gadgets that they have to have today. Nobody had anything like that. We had a lot of mosquitoes. Oh, they were horrible. The mosquitoes were quite fierce, though. Oh, they cover you. 
I mean, you walk you walk outside of a building and they just, your whole arms, everything will just be black with them. And you always build a smudge pot, let the smoke go into your front of your house. And it cover everything. You smell a little smoky, but you didn't get no mosquitoes. I always slept on a sleeping porch and uh, the mosquitoes were so bad, I'd put my hand up on the screen. And the mosquitoes would bite on it, and when you take your hand away, there would be a perfect handprint on the, the screen. <laughs> In 57, they were spraying. It wasn't like it was before 57. So as an owner of the trailer park, we could go get the truck and spray for mosquitoes. Just, they'd leave the key in it, and that's how, that's how mosquito control came about in Cape Canaveral. It was DDT, which turned out to be not such a good thing, but we all thought it was wonderful at the time. I can remember my poor mother trying to hang clothes out there at 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning to dry, and, and mosquitoes, and just wiping the mosquitoes off you, and hoping the fogging machine would come by, you know. Well, mosquitoes are bad, but you know, the thing is, they talk about losing a lot of uh, fishing now, 80% uh, of your wetlands in Florida are filled in with, with, so they can build apartments or high-rise, whatever. They were also dredging and building stuff up, diking things, you know, so they could get rid of mosquitoes. When they started filling in these places on the marshes here, take the breeding grounds away. The fish count's going down steady, and they, even though there's no commercial fishing now. When I went to school out, it was at Kent Canaveral, out on Canaveral Beach. And we went to school up there until the seventh grade, and then we went to Coco, which was a long ride. Went to school out at the, by, in the little one-room schoolhouse out at the, by the lighthouse. The, the public school was only open two years after I started, and then they transferred all of us to Coco because of a lack of students. Then we were sent to Coco, and that was in the middle of my little third grade. And it was kind of a shock because <laughs> there were a lot of kids in the class and I was used to not very many. We left early in the morning, got home late in the afternoon. Most years we went down to um, Patrick, which was Banana River Naval Air Station, picked up the, the kids that were there. Went to Cocoa Beach, across the old Banana River Wooden Bridge, and then up through Angel City. You say Angel City, it's not a city. It was just a bunch of houses, that's all. And uh, in fact, just like it is now, it's just houses down through there. There was probably uh, three dozen people there built over there. And they were all fishermen, every one of them. Yeah, my father had a fish house there. And we picked up the children in Angel City. Traveled up to Audubon, come back west across the Humpback Bridge into 520 and then cross the, the Indian River on a wooden bridge also. So it was, uh, it was about an hour trip. <laughs> there was probably uh, oh, 300 people from, from here all the way out to the end of the Cape or north of the Cape too. When we first moved out there, it was, and being young and being so separated from other families, there was not a whole lot you could do. I mean, you just had to uh, improvise for yourself, uh, learn to live with, off the land, and that's what we did as kids. My, my childhood was spent gigging stingeries. My, my goal in life was to rid the, the Banana River of stingeries, and so I would gig them, and then I would throw them up on the shore, and by tomorrow the coons and possums would have carried them off. But we had bicycles. We had uh, part of the roads were paved, part of them were sand. And I had uh, my close friend, Benji Lewis. We hunted together, or we kayaked together, or we went to the beach together. I surfed a lot. My dad was a fisherman and we had a lot of boats, and so we went sailing a lot. And, and the usual things that kids do when they don't have anything else to do. It was a lot of fun, and it was free. That was the main thing. But it was, uh, it was a lot different. And we, we didn't really know what the other kids in the other cities or other towns were doing because we were pretty isolated out here. 
because it was 21 miles to the nearest town. That meant going to Coco. And uh, about the only cars that went back and forth to Coco were the mailman and the grocery man. When I was a child, there was a grocery store out on Pier Road, uh, Whitten's store, and it was one of those jot em down stores where you could buy everything from, from um, a loaf of bread to a truss. It was a very interesting store. I loved to go in there because uh, there was so much to look at. A trip to the store in those days was more a social thing than it was a necessity. I mean, of course, you, you had to have bread, uh, but um, you would go and visit with whoever was there. That was it. Well, we had to go to Coco to buy anything. There was nothing in Cocoa Beach or, or Cape Canaveral. If you really wanted serious groceries, you got in the car and you went to Coco and you went to A&P or Piggly Wiggly. That was when you got meat and staples of all sorts, but um, it wasn't a, anything to be undertaken lightly. I mean, you didn't just hop in the car and say, I think I'll go down to the store. Um, you planned ahead. It was quite a day when you went to town. Because you go up early in the morning, you come back, you'd be, you'd be dark when you got back. I mean, it's just going to buy groceries. When I was a child, of course, there were all kinds of wildlife up on the Cape and all, you know, all between the lighthouse and where my uncles lived and, and did all their hunting, and there were always deer. We would catch sea turtles that were coming up on the beach. At that time, there was no law against catching them, and you would uh, catch them, butcher them, and you pack them in salt. That was your meat. Well, you catch the turtle, and you, if it's north of you, you, you put a, a rope around his right flipper, let him go back in the ocean, and then just walk along with him. He'll just swim himself right down where you get him, pull him out on the beach. Flip him over and cut his throat. Well, a pan, manatee will run probably in six to 2,000 pounds. You know, they're, they're pretty big. And uh, that would feed about 15 or 20 families from that maybe uh, three or four t meals out of each one. Well, we had rattlesnakes, you know, and stuff like that, and a couple panthers, some wildcats. This was early one, one morning, and we were going duck hunting, and we was going to off through the Palmetto Breaks, you know, and then all of a sudden we heard this rattlesnake, and I almost stepped on him, and just backed off, and I just started shooting. I shot both of them, and one of them was seven feet and four inches, and the other one was six foot and two inches. I don't know if there is any big ones like that anymore. But see, at that time, there was not too much around here to bother them. And uh, now, all of their habitat and everything is all just about all gone. And all you see is the young one, younger ones. Of course, I think the big change came when Patrick Air Force Base, yeah. uh, formerly known as Banana River Naval Air Station, was built during the, uh, World War II. That, that was the big change. When they completed the, the station, you know, a lot, we had a lot of naval people here. I, I know by that time, all the, the Navy guys, you know, ran off with all the girls. I had two, co two cousins, both of them married Navy men. Well, they used to land planes in the river down there by Patrick when it was Banana River Naval Air Station. That's why there's an area down there that's dug out, and it's deeper. It's because they landed planes down there. Right after World War II, I think the Navy said, hey, we don't want this place no more. We're just going to shut her down, because they, they couldn't afford to run it, probably. And then it set kind of like in a kind of a little idle status for a while. My mother had bought one of the, the duplexes that they phased out down at Banana River Naval Air Station and she chose to put hers out alongside the post office or just behind the post office um, and rented it. And then about that time I think it started playing around with the idea of the launch system out here and then things started 
and the government wouldn't turn loose of it anyhow, and they finally opened it back up. The Air Force did. You know, for the Joint Long Range Proving Ground. And then uh, from that day on, it's been nothing but just grow, 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 grow. Well, I remember when we lived out there, you could, you could buy all of that cape that you wanted for 10 cents an acre and pay the taxes on it. Nobody wanted it. The property we had was out close to where the lighthouse is now. They had 160 acres out there. And when he bought it, the realtor took him out there and they got stuck in the sand. And Dad said, does it look like this? It was all just, swamp, you know, just brush and sand. And the guy said, yeah, it looks like this. And Dad said, OK, I'll buy it. And he bought it for $10 an acre. That was Titusville Beach. In fact, the house that the astronauts recreate in belonged to my husband's half-brother. They took it from him, and they kept it because Harvey had kept it up. The government gave us about $35 an acre, and uh, you couldn't go anywhere in Brevard County and buy any land for that. Even swamp, you couldn't buy it. But uh, that's what they got, that's what was it. Some of those people were in their 60s or 70s. They couldn't just get up and go and move somewhere else. They, they, their whole life was here. They'd raised their children here, they'd gone to school here. It was, it was kind of rough on them. They took it to court, but they lost. They took it to court and said they wanted an equal amount of land or equal amount of money for what we had to pay for land. But the government never gave it to them. They lost the case. When they put in the missile base, it was very traumatic for everybody um, because it disturbed the peace. <laughs> Everybody was, was bitter because they were thrown out of their land that they had homesteaded and been on for years and years and raised a family. And, and most people over here were dirt poor. Um, and, but they had managed to, to make a living by hunting and fishing and whatever it was they did, collect palmetto berries or, you know, everybody was very versatile in those days and they did a lot of things uh, to make money. Some of the houses that were there were moved off the Cape. The government allowed them to move their houses, but they had to pay for it to do it. I mean, the people had to pay to do it. The government didn't pay for it. My parents, we didn't have to move our house. As I said, the line was the port, but my parents owned some riverfront property up on the Cape. They owned 20 acres up there, and the government gave them $1,000 for 20 acres. Well, everybody was fit to be tied, you know, because nobody wanted to leave their homes. And then everybody, you know, started settling through this area. The city of Cape Canaveral began to expand in the early 1950s. The landscape was changing. A seaport was dredged. The first rocket pads were built. The entire world would soon be watching men launched into space on experimental rockets. This was an era that will never be forgotten. The historical significance of a man walking on the moon inspired a new generation of scientists, engineers, and explorers. As the population of Cape Canaveral grew, so did the need to record and document the historical events in our city's history. Anne Thurm not only served in our city government, she had a passion for preserving the history of Cape Canaveral. When I first came here, I made friends with an old lady, and she was a direct descendant of Captain Burnham, who was the first lighthouse keeper. And I found out that there had been very little ever written about this area. It was just an opportunity, I thought, to put down what needed to be recorded, which was the history of Cape Canaveral. Since 1950, uh, we've owned, my family, my grandparents have owned a home here in the city of Cape Canaveral. And they brought it, bought it from the Chandler family, uh, which is one of the original families here in the area. My grandfather uh, loved to fish. And the reason they established uh, their home, or home away from home in Cape Canaveral was because of the wonderful fishing out in the lagoon. The city of Cape Canaveral developed in a few different stages over the years, I think. One, originally as sort of a getaway, a low-key getaway for fishermen and, and, and those types, um, more country flavor to it. 
Of course, when I drove through in, in, in May of 1956, I didn't do m much exploring. It was, uh, it was really country. And when I went back home to visit my friends, they, they kind of chuckled a little bit behind my back. Oh, you went to Florida <laughs> and bought some of that swamp down there. <laughs> and uh, we came down here in, in 56. And I came down with my mother and father, and then we all moved in a little 50 by 8 foot wide mobile home. Rather crowded, no air conditioning. Uh, very hard sleeping at night, mosquitoes. Oh, I asked my mom and dad why they did this to us. You know, we were just young kids. I was only like 15. And I come out of a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, where I just turned the corner and there was a hundred things to do. Here you turned the corner and there wasn't anything, no matter which corner you turned. I moved to Cocoa Beach in 1961. My dad got a job at the Space Center and we came down from Pennsylvania. And in 1961, when we first landed over in Orlando, we came in at night and there wasn't a traffic light between Orlando and the house in Cocoa Beach, and we thought we had moved to hell. <laughs> yeah, I brought my folks down on vacation, and uh, we stopped on the way back at uh, Max Friendly Tavern and <laughs> had a couple of fast beers. And I said, what do people you know, around here do for a living? And he said, well, they pick fruit, and then they're starting to uh, a deal out here at Cape Canaveral, they're going to launch missiles out here. And I said, oh great. So I went home and sold the property up there. And I was walking down the street in Cocoa Beach and there was a NASA recruiting uh, desk sitting out on the sidewalk. They had just set up a desk on the sidewalk. <laughs> and I asked him, what would I have to do to get a job with NASA? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, you could go to work Monday morning if you had an engineering degree. Well, I came here in uh, April of 1958, uh, worked for WEZY, a local radio station. I was Mobile Mike. I was a guy running up and down the causeway out there making reports and you know, whenever we had an accident because most of the roads in those days were two lanes and we had one accident blocking a lane, you couldn't get home. One of the other things I remember about the city at that time was that all, most of the roads were sandy, uh, just sandy streets without any pavement. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It had a very uh, sort of country feel, uh, which is strange in today's world to have a country feel uh, near, the, near the ocean. We started from scratch. I mean, we had practically no roads. We had shell roads. The roads I remember very distinctly, they were like one pothole after another. The Morrill Road came straight from Cocoa Beach right through the port, right on straight north. And uh, you didn't start going around this thing until they bridged the port in. The back of our trailer park, you asked how many spaces were in it, it was only 26, and the back of it was all swamp because the river came up. That was before they they dredged North Atlantic Avenue was the only way up to the Cape. And when they let the Cape out um, in 57, all the workers were on that road. And at three o'clock you were home and you didn't go anywhere because there was so much traffic out there. Oh, you couldn't move. You simply could not move. So roads was a big problem and they got a lot of that taken care of as quickly as they could. People were coming in fast and, and furiously and there was no place for them to live. People came here and several uh, mobile home parks uh, sprang up and several apartment houses were built because finding living quarters here was really a big challenge. It was pretty barren, <laughs> as you see it now. There wasn't a lot of development. Um, actually, between Ocean Woods and the port, there was nothing on the, the west side of North Atlantic Avenue. And between us and Avon by the Sea, there was nothing. What, what I would call residences, there was probably maybe 50 different families that would be residents. At that time, it was transient population. 
It was a boom town. Cocoa Beach and Cape Canaveral were, were a boom town, like Dodge City. We were just building up for the Apollo program. Lots of transients, lots of reporters, lots of uh, camera people, media people in town all the time for launches. You know, I think mostly about the early days here was that this was such a small town community because in Brevard County, all of these communities were small. Cocoa was the saltwater trout capital of the world. Uh, Cocoa Beach in Cape Canaveral was so beautiful, a single lane highway or two lane highway coming through in the gorgeous uh, Australian pines that were over. And it was really a small town community where everybody knew one another. And so people came in and here all of a sudden, instead of a community that had ages ranging from uh, children all the way up into the 70s or 80s, the overwhelming majority were all young people. The average age was 27. So therefore, it was a very young com uh, community. It was a can-do community. It was simply the most exciting place on the face of the earth because things were being done here that had never been done before. And after all, uh, the President of the United States had committed us to go to the moon before the decade was out. This nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. So the early 60s here was really something else. Everybody enjoyed being here. Everybody enjoyed being part of it. Everybody took great pride in it because it was a foundation that was laid in a community that has grown since. But we'll never recapture that time again. And I suppose it's sort of akin to the Alaskan gold fields or the 49ers going to California because it was just a boom town. It was new and everybody was young and everybody was enjoying themselves. I just come back from vacation up north and people were, uh, asked me, well, aren't you afraid of one of those is gonna go haywire one of these days down in the area? I said, oh no, they've got a self-destruct package. <laughs> and uh, they'd never let that happen. <laughs> and it just so happened that uh, that happened right after I come back from vacation. Of course, in the early days, the uh press corps, the Cape Canaveral press corps, we had to drive all the way to Patrick Air Force Base and get on an Air Force bus, which was rather stupid, to ride from Patrick Air Force Base through Cocoa Beach, a 15, 20 minute ride. Then we would go on, go to the press site. They would not open our phones until a fire in the tail. After we had fire in the tail, then we could go on the air, we could report it. As a matter of fact, the first launch of a solid rocket uh, from here was the Polaris One. I worked on that project for some years, submarine, I was a submarine calibration technician. And that was one of our dry launches that landed over the Banana River. Pre-ignition pre separation of the second stage before it was supposed to do that. And they made the huge mistake of putting the same destruct package on it as they used on liquid rockets. Of course, being a fuel of kerosene and an oxidizer of liquid oxygen, any kind of ignition would just burn it rapidly and would destroy it. So you wouldn't have to worry about a rocket falling on anybody. But with solid fuel, it was a different thing. And what happened was that they, it went awry. Uh, the first one that went awry went and landed right in the back of the Coca Palm trailer park, out about 300 yards out in the river. And my wife and uh, several of her neighbors were sitting there watching it. It was spiraling all over the place. They didn't know where it was coming down. And they finally put a destruct package in it then. And they hit the destruct package. It blew the two stages apart. The second stage came back and fell near us. We were on top of a radar building out there, but the first stage kept going toward, we thought, Rock Ledge. I was standing in the front lawn there with my wife. And uh, we, we saw it launch. And, and uh, uh, my next door neighbor, uh, Bob, he uh, said, there's something wrong there. And I said, yeah, I said, uh, uh, they never tracked this way. And, <laughs> and here it got away from them. And it blew up over a Carver's Cove trailer park. And that's what uh, moved it out into the river. 
I, I believe it was my, one of my husband's launches, <laughs> and and they were wrong. They were a little nervous till they found out where it had gone and that it had indeed missed the trailer park. <laughs> and the Air Force would not open the phones and let us get on the air. And we said, well, if you're not going to let us report this, get us off of your base. Take us off your base. We got on the bus, and as we went through the south gate of the Cape, I jumped out of the door. I find out that the Polaris only went in the Banana River behind the Hitch and Post trailer court. So he drops me off, and I go running down there, and here's the rocket with the steam coming up and people all lined along the river looking right behind this trailer court. But I says, is anyone hurt? And they said, no, nobody's hurt. It landed out there, didn't touch anything. You know, and everybody was talking about uh, something else. And I said, what, what, nobody's hurt? What are you talking about? They said. And there, there was a woman. I lived in that front house, and the woman in the first trailer was German. And she had been in the bathtub when that thing went over. And she come running outside, stark naked, and because she, she thought it was falling on the trailer park and she wasn't going to be in the trailer. <laughs> and then she looked down and, oh, you know, and she ran back in the house. And when this happened at a commotion, she came running out, ran out on the dock with everybody else and then realized that she hadn't put on any clothes whatsoever. <laughs> so, so she had to run back in and get some clothes, you know, and I said, and, and you know, the next day in the Coco Tribune newspaper, that got more ink in the Polaris going, there. <laughs> going into the uh, river. That got us thinking, you know, are we prepared for something like this? And, uh, so we, as a fire department, we took some special training on, on what to do in case one of those rockets were to hit somewhere here in the city. And thank God it never occurred, but uh, that threat is always, uh, always there, for sure. The fire department was established in 1962 as a uh, volunteer fire department, not-for-profit corporation in the state of Florida, um, actually established prior to uh, the city of Cape Canaveral actually incorporating. The charter members were given a piece of property by the brochures uh, with the conditions that a fire department had to be built within one year and also if it wasn't used as a fire department or for civil defense, which they used to call it back then, um, it would revert back to um, the original owners or their heirs. They were family out of Orlando, I believe, is where they originated from, Dixon Brazier and R.B. Brazier. They were people that, uh, they were involved in the Orlando Sentinel in some way. As I recall, they were newspaper people. So recently, uh, we were able to track down the heirs of the brochures, and it was a Mrs. White. She graciously um, donated the property or took the reversion clause out and gave the property to the fire department, um, basically with no strings attached with the exception of uh, with whatever we do, we put the brochure's names on that building somewhere and, and people know that they did give that to us. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. You know, I'm watching John Adams on, on the DVD now, looking back at the Founding Fathers, <clears throat> and I see a lot of parallels to the first founding founders of this nation, to the, the city fathers and the city leadership of this town, because they always have the good of the town at heart. There were strong personalities. I know that there was uh, Charlie Applegate, uh, Bill Everwine, uh, George Rogers, uh, Leo Collins, Frank Hogue, those names come to my mind. And I don't really know how they decided that he was going to be the mayor. Maybe nobody else just wanted to do it. Anybody that was doing anything in the city, anybody that was running for anything in the city or wanted to change anything in the city always came to him first. I think Leo Collins was the most outspoken, very intellectual. He was a mathematician. Charles Applegate, who was looking out for the trailer park owners. There was Frank Hogue, who was looking out for the trailer park owners, because that's where the votes were. And Bill Eberwein, he was a guy with a big heart. He, uh, he was, he was, a, he, he was a, a Florida cracker. And Mr. Eberwein, who, who had a trailer park, 
He didn't talk unless he felt he had something to contribute or that he felt he knew what he was talking about. And he was a nice guy to have on the council. <laughs> Applegate and Bill Eberwein sort of voted, voted, to, voted together. They were, they were here when I moved here. I can remember, I can remember Mr. Thurm being here and he was building the trailer park at the same time. Well, Dick and Ann owned the Hitching Post trailer park. Uh, Mr. Scabarosi, I can remember him working around his trailer park. And, and Gene Jandro, he was just a nice local guy. Uh, didn't ruffle any, any feathers. My uncle's name was F.L. Murphy, and, uh, and he moved here before the city was incorporated. He uh, was also a preacher, a very religious man. He was kind of like my father. If he decided to do something, he just went ahead and did it. <laughs> and uh, Jack, Jack Hurt was outspoken. They used to call him showboat, because he liked attention. Well, we all like attention. <laughs> Of all the people in this city who deserves to be recognized as having done a lot, it's Leo. And he, he changed. I think Dick Thurm, you know, it was mayor for so long that uh, sort of kept a, a good hand on the, the reins uh, in guiding the city. Everybody knew that something, something big was, was about to happen. The city actually was founded in 1962, although in the city calls itself as being founded in 1963, but as, as in my book, it was actually 62 that the city was started. So I had a good friend that worked for Pan Am and he and uh, Jamie Jamison came up and they came up to see me. They told us about the incorporation and uh, the opposition and the, uh, those that were pro. I know there was opposition and I know there was a lot of heated uh, discussion about it, but I, a lot of people didn't want to, didn't want to be part of anything. Well, most of the people who were from here didn't want to incorporate with, with uh, Cape Canaveral or Cocoa Beach. They wanted to stay county, like it always been. But that was really, uh, I mean, I was one of the ones that didn't want it either, but I came around to thinking it was a good idea. Bill, Bill Eberwein and, and uh, Charles Applegate, they were quite active in getting the city started along with Jameson. I think Jameson went to them and got their support because he couldn't do it alone. At the port, they were building these huge oil tanks, and that was it. that was in an area that is now the city of Cape Canaveral. And I remember Leo Collins, one of the members of our city council, he got real concerned because uh, he bought a house not too far from there. And uh, the question was really, really laid out: uh, Are they going to are they going to build more oil oil tanks? Port going to expand to the south uh, with industrial uh, installations, and so I think that uh, motivated a number of people. And we had, you know, people in here that were executives in the space programs, and uh, they were thinking ahead and uh, interested in a nice place to live. And Raymond Jameson, he headed up a, a committee and they sent out letters for people's opinions as to what their desire would be. One of them was to join Cocoa Beach, make it a, have a city. They wanted to see, they needed uh, facilities. And the area <clears throat> where, where we were, they needed roads, improvement in roads. We had no city sewers. It was a, a real concern of a lot of people. So the people who lived here, some of the people, just started talking about what would be wrong in us having our own city. And I didn't know my, my husband, who was the first mayor, I didn't know him then, but that happened, what, around 62, I think, when they decided that they just didn't like being called. According to my, this is according to what he told me, they didn't, uh, Cocoa Beach was thinking about annexing Cape Canaveral 
I said, no way, man. We're not gonna, and the people in Harbor Heights who owned homes there were really upset. I think Harbor Heights were the people that were more upset. We just wanted to be separate. Their taxes were kind of high at the time, and, and we wanted to be a, a separate uh, entity here. The, the charter basically was uh, to prevent ta taxation. Of course, what scared a lot of the people was the, was the high tax rate that uh, we perceived Cocoa Beach to have. And uh, people don't like to pay taxes. In fact, I, went, I was a sort of a spy. I went to Cocoa Beach meeting when they were getting an idea up to, to take over Cape Canaveral. I was supposed to get all the information and uh, what happened was I had a little notepad with me and I was writing it down and one of the guys, one of the, one of the head ones at the meeting saw what I was doing. He knew, he knew I wasn't from Cocoa Beach. So uh, he asked me to leave. The way Cape Canaveral came about, and this once again is hearsay, is the city of Cocoa Beach, when they incorporated, planned on this part of the, becoming part of the city of Cocoa Beach, but this would be the industrial section. And when that word came back to the uh, trailer park owners here, they said, hey, let's not be part of Cocoa Beach, let's, let's have our own city. So they got together, and that's why it was with Fran Jameson's help and uh, all the other uh, businessmen here, uh, trailer park owners, they formed the city of Cape Canaveral. Well, I don't think there was any strong movement in Cocoa Beach to do any annexing. Uh, I know uh, Bob Murchie, he, uh, he promoted that, and in fact, he, I think he attended some of, the, some of the council meetings with that in mind. Uh, but I don't think he had a lot of support on, on, on his commission down there, and uh, it went away. I remember very distinctly a few things about the first incorporation of the city, they had met in the mid-Florida freezer up at the Tropicana orange juice plant when they first started talking incorporation. The residents were invited to a committee to establish, establish the city. And Ray Jameson conducted the meeting. And there was William Eberwine. He was uh, one of the uh, pioneers. And there was uh, George Rogers. I think he worked at the Cape in the space program. And there was Charles Applegate. He uh, had a mobile home park, and he was a property owner. There was Don Clayton. We had the meeting, and there was uh, five people who were elected. Raymond Jameson was elected mayor. The procedure was uh, uh, organizing or, or establishing a city under some state, uh, state statute. It went on for a few months, and someone raised the question whether the city was uh, established uh, following the state statutes uh, on an um, accurate basis. Maybe to be safe, we better do it over again. We better vote over again. They did the second vote because some uh, people, for some reason or the other, they thought maybe the first vote wasn't accurate. So in June, we all got together and and uh, the consensus was, yeah, let's, you know, what the heck, let's go. So at that meeting, the name, I think in the original meeting, I think it was, I think they selected the name of uh, Town of Cape Canaveral. In the uh, June meeting, we voted on the name of the city. There was a lot of people from, from other states that was here in that meeting. It was about maybe 50, 60 people, I don't remember exactly. And uh, they were all coming up with names, Cape Canaveral, Port Canaveral, Canaveral Beach, and so forth. And I, I stood up and I held up my hand and I said, yes. And I said, what about Artesia? He said, where did you get a name like that? I said, baby, you're standing right in the middle of it. <laughs> but we voted and um, voted on it and the name uh, was uh, approved as the city of Cape Canaveral, followed by the name of Funiac, which was originally the constable, was replaced by uh, a man by the name of Staten. And Don Clayton wasn't <laughs> re-elected. Uh, and, and Leo Collins was, a, was elected in the second go around. So there were a couple changes, but that's, that's, that's politics. At, at that meeting of incorporation, 
friend Jameson advised that the city appoint, elect the uh, a charter board. They discussed having and getting made up a city charter. So they elected a group of men to be what they call the uh, charter board. They elected them and gave them, I guess, a year to create a city charter. Uh, Mr. Scabarosi was one of the gentlemen that had a, a mobile home park at Cape Canaveral Trailer Village. And I know the city hall met in there for a, kind of a few incorporation meetings. The, uh, those meetings that were held uh, in, in the uh, trailer park uh, were before the city was chartered. I know there were a lot of planning sessions that were held there. We worked over the next, next number of months, hearings and put it together. And the charter board uh, worked on this charter and in one year, which would have been 63, then the city charter was accepted. So we really had a, uh, a bona fide, legal, incorporated city, and, and, and everybody, was, everybody was real happy. And uh, then my father's trailer park, they held the actual city meetings in the trailer park for, he had a, a quite a large uh, recreation room down there, and this, the original city council met in there. Frank Hogue, which built uh, Coca Palms Mobile Home Park, he uh, donated the use of his recreation room building. I, I used to stand outside of the, the, the recreation room had jealousy windows, or those glass slatted windows and they opened them up. And, and I can remember as a kid, I was standing outside and listening to all that's going on out there. And Mr. Jameson was the, the uh, mayor. And uh, when I went to a meeting one night, which I, I was very interested in all this going on all the time. And, I, I didn't know what infrastructure meant. I was like 14 or 15, and I didn't know what a I didn't know what a franchise was. And, but I remember they were talking about a franchise, and I was standing there listening. And this this Mr. Applegate looked at me and says, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "I'm I'm here. I want to I want to see what you guys are doing." And I was uh, politely asked to leave. You know, he just said, "Well, you need to leave for the." I said, well, my daddy owns this place. I can remember that to this day. I said, my daddy owns this place. And I walked away from him and I went over and I talked to my dad and my dad said, well, you just go over there and sit down if you want to watch. And I watched. But uh, it was, uh, what would we call smoke, smoke filled back rooms, I guess that type of thing going on. And uh, I can remember some real dog fights and you know, they would uh, really, get down to business. And then we, we moved to a, an office building right on A1A for, for a short period of time. Uh, it was just like a storage storage shed. I think it was over in uh, Buchanan or Lincoln. And it was like a, like one room. We put a few petitions up. The back part was the, the, uh, the assembly room the, uh, for the media, for public meetings. The mayor <laughs> had a chair <laughs> in front of the desk of the city clerk. Everybody knew everybody, you know, first, first name basis. And um, things went along, uh, I would say, surprisingly smooth for, you know, for a political <laughs> endeavor. But we had no place, no place to have our meeting, so the volunteer fire department, they had, in the meantime, built a building and uh, they invited us to have our council meetings. And, yeah. The volunteer fire department, way back when, was kind of the heart of the city of Cape Canaveral. I mean, the elections were held in the station. The they rented space from us to, you know, answer their phones. And I mean, you got to realize that when the city was starting up, they had nothing. I mean, it was just a concept. And once they incorporated, they needed a place to house everybody, so they used our facilities because it had been there. The Cape Canaveral Fire Department did a lot of good things for the city. I mean, we, uh, we really gave back to the community and uh, it was a good organization. I mean, that station was built with the blood, sweat and tears of, of the individuals. I mean, we didn't contract it out, we built it ourselves. So 
We had a business out at the port that uh, imported lumber and I was able to convince them to donate the material needed to build the trusses and we built, built the trusses and the roof ourselves right there on the concrete pad in front of the station. And Rinker had a uh, concrete truck catch fire one time and we were able to, to put that fire out and in the process of doing it we got them to donate the block to put the building up. And it was just all the time out scrounging, asking for, for donations for this and, and that. There was a, a building that was sitting behind George's Steakhouse that we heard they were going to tear down and it had some good, uh, really telephone pole beams in it and we got them to let us take the building down and we kept the beams and the back part of the station is built out of those telephone pole beams. The original station is still standing in 80. Five, I believe it was, they added on uh, bays, and the original jail cell was still there. Uh, it was used for the first police department. We leased out the east side to the police department, and that's when uh, Murphy had his, his jail that, uh, that uh, was illegal. A little window in the end of the, the cell there that, uh, you know, a guy could stick a gun through there, and, and, and and do some damage to a prisoner, so they, you know, the law shut that down. In, in the early years when the fire department started, basically the only real development in the city was along the President Streets here, and it was mainly duplexes. The rest of the city was vacant land, and with vacant land comes brush fires, and that was the, the biggest call that we ever had was brush fires. The first truck we had was a pickup truck that was built into a brush truck by the volunteers by putting together parts and pieces that created a fire truck. And then we got a truck called a Seagrave. It was a 750 gallon pumper that uh, we bought used. It, it serviced us for oh, a lot of years, 20 years I guess. Okay, my husband Howard was a volunteer fireman in the, at the Cape Canaveral Volunteer Fire Department for 10 years. We had a a little electronic box in our bedroom, it was called a Plectron, and the call would come in there that there was a fire somewhere. He would jump in the car, rush to the fire station, and then they would get on the truck and go. They had to go to the fire station to get their gear. We would train every Wednesday night. Uh, we'd start at six o'clock and usually train for about three hours. And then every Saturday we would spend the day around the station doing maintenance on the equipment and or the buildings or fundraising. The organization was basically 100% volunteer until approximately 1987. It was all volunteers in the beginning. And well, when I was chief, I got the first paid fireman. We had fundraisers. Uh, we had fish fries once a month. We, uh, we did a lot of fundraising efforts. We built our own uh, grease pit. And we'd fry them up and had a, quite a following. A lot of people looked forward to that muscly fish fry. It was a big social thing, a fun thing, but it was also helping the firemen and raising money. Well, there probably wasn't anything that the city didn't have that the fire department wasn't involved in. I mean, if we had a parade, we'd be in it. We'd help organize it. We'd help run the Little League. Just about everything that went on in the city, the volunteers were involved in one form or fashion. Some of us women, the wives got together and thought, well, it'd be nice if we formed an auxiliary to support the, the firemen in their efforts. They would always have a Santa Claus go around the city at Christmas time. Santa goes around every year on the back of the fire truck, throwing candy out to all the kids and blowing the siren with a police escort. And the kids look forward to it. I know my daughter, she loved it. Here comes Fireman, here comes Santa Claus. <laughs> so I became the Santa Claus. I guess it was uh, probably December of 66 or 67, I'm not sure which. And I flew in by helicopter. The neat thing was my kids didn't know that I was gonna be Santa Claus. And I remember asking uh, my older son, have you been good to your brother, Chris? And he looked at me like that. And he, he didn't know who I was. It was very entertaining. In 1963, we, uh, we built a new city hall where it is, where it is right now. 
It was paid for. We didn't have to float a bond issue or anything. Uh, early on, uh, we had our own city hall within the two years of the city being chartered. We did have cocoa water, but we didn't have a sewer system. Uh, when they put in the water, I don't think there was any opposition to the water, but there was uh, opposition to putting in central sewage system because everybody was on septic tank. And a big player in the city was Shuford Mills. They were a textile company out of Hickory, North Carolina. Alex Shuford came down and spoke to him several times. And he offered to, to put up a uh, temporary sewer plant. Shuford Mills uh, did a lot to bring uh, improvements and developments uh, to the city, particularly on, on the north end, where all the newest development occurred. We uh, floated a bond issue to buy the, uh, the wastewater treatment operation. We floated a bond issue to uh, put in a storm drainage system and to pave the streets. I was involved in the storm drains, which were quite big, uh, and they came in during my administration, and then paving the streets. I walked the streets getting, uh, getting support to put in a storm drainage system, but everybody was very receptive. Because of the Department of Environmental Protection, we've had to make constant improvements to our, our sewer plant. They kept, kept on demanding a higher level of purity for the discharge. Supposedly could drink it coming right out and they dumped that back into the Banana River. There was a period where there was so few problems compared to what we might think about today. Because everybody just, you know, we were all in the same, but everybody just wanted a nice place to live. And, it was an easy going town. A lot of friends, minimum problems. Politics caused more problems in the neighborhood than in most any, anything else. As this group of people who put the city together, they decided we should have a police department. And actually this little city was too small to have a police department or to have a decent one. So they got two or three guys around town and said, you know, you're going to be a policeman. My husband was the, the first sheriff uh, of Cape Canaveral when we incorporated. And it wasn't through choice. It was because somebody said, we need one, you're it and we're going to find somebody else over here and he's going to be a police chief. And so the city went on like that and we had... We had volunteer policemen. But, you know, people, people didn't do too, too many bad things. I mean, at least not that I heard of. Uncle Philip was there a volunteer policeman. He said that it was not very much fun. He, there wasn't much to do and he said the most exciting thing he had to do was go down to the straw hat uh, and on election day and tell them that they couldn't sell liquor. A man who was one of our first fire chiefs that couldn't, he couldn't read or write, but he was hired as a police chief. They picketed City Hall. <laughs> they were out there, we were having this meeting and here these people right there would Packers picketing the meeting, you know, don't fire Wembley, don't fire Wembley. Well, Wembley, it turned out, couldn't read or write. Uh, we had our own police department. Unfortunately, uh, it, uh, it was deficient in, in, in a lot of ways. The thing was, we were too poor, money-wise, to have a decent police department. Frankly, we didn't have enough money. I'll never forget. Uh, one, one evening they, they fired the city manager and the city attorney all in one swoop. It was more contentious back then than it is now. The fire was flying when I got there. My dad got fired, Willard Winnett got fired, and I guess everybody on the council was happy except for the two that got fired. So the meeting was very disruptive. I can remember a lot of screaming and shouting going on. And, one of the gentlemen in particular stood up and was beating on the dais and hollering and there wasn't no sunshine law at that time that we have to live under today. We 
we can't discuss between us today anymore. Sit down and have a cigar and a beer and get it all fixed up and work it out. But there was a couple that didn't like Mr. Winnett. So there was a swap that was going to take place. The ones that liked my dad didn't like Winnett, and the ones that liked Winnett didn't like my father. So you can figure the cigar smoke rooms took care of that business. And I can remember very distinctly that uh, he and Mr. Winnett were talking, and he said, we'll get this straightened out. That's what kind of got my dad involved in becoming a council person. And uh, eventually my dad ran for city council and got elected. And I was uh, sitting at the house tonight, my dad got elected. A phone call was made to Akron, Ohio, where Mr. Winnett moved to. And he told Willard, pack your bags, you're coming back. The police chief that we had for, for many years, Willard Winnett, and Willard, Willard was a good man. Uh, and, and he did, did a lot of good things. But uh, he eventually retired. Willard Winnett was always a gentleman. I always liked Willard. But Willard, see, was under the direction of the police commissioner, Frank Hope. You know, he uh, got one of our, our first paid firemen. He finally got him. And so we had to have an understanding that no more of that, because, you know, it, it takes a while to train a new man. He was always very good to his men, but I, he might have had one one person that uh, had a different personality. When it was sort of flamboyant, he loved to talk. Will Willard was quite a character. I, he uh, kind of reminded me of the, the Jesse James type guy with two six shooters. And, <laughs> and Willard didn't have a lot of uh, diplomacy when it come to uh, speaking to issues. And so he rubbed some city councilmen the wrong way because he wasn't going to take their uh, their direction. The city ended up hiring a guy named Bob Tweed who came out of uh, Delaware as our next police chief. Uh, he didn't last all that long. He, he was in, in the in office for something less than six months and he was campaigning for the sheriff. Was not the man for the job that we needed. But as a consequence of these changes, there was a lot of turmoil in the department. The thought was Let's see if we can get the sheriff to provide the protection for us. Part of the, the initial contract was that they, uh, they would hire all of the present, the employed uh, police personnel. One of the things they did that I thought was especially cool was when they eliminated the local police force and contracted that over with the sheriff's department. I think that was so great because no longer were councilmen involved in the politics of the police department. Well, the, the sheriff's department is is the sheriff's department, and the sheriff's department that's in the city is kind of the sheriff's department in the city. It's quite different than just being in the county and having the sheriff. We kind of we kind of uh, direct what we want and what kind of service we want, and we pay for what we what we need. The initial contract, I think, was something like thirty-two thousand dollars. And we're up to about two and a half million dollars now, but, but we've got a bigger department. We've got a, a professional department, well trained. Personally, I like to see us have our own police department. Mostly because we're a small town, and there's no reason why we shouldn't. And generally, the the philosophy is: if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And uh, the people are uh, pretty much satisfied with the level of service that the sheriff is providing, so we'll just, I'm sure we'll just go keep on going that route. The dispute over the police department came before the dispute with the fire department. And then again, it was over control. They, they wanted control, and they had uh, a police chief that uh, just was gonna do it his way, and the city council said, well, we'll, we'll do it a different way, and that's when they contract with the Brevard County Sheriff's Department. We did have one difficult time. Uh, it was a political squabble over who really controlled the volunteer fire department. There was contention between the volunteers and the city. The city felt that there would regulations and requirement that the volunteer fire department would be required to adhere to because after all, it was a public safety 
uh, organization. There were some elected officials in the city that thought that the city should call the shots on how the department was run. And they even went so far as to start their own fire department. So the city said, okay, you're gonna, you can forget about getting your yearly allowance. And uh, they built a building right behind City Hall to house, uh, to start a fire department. We went and got an initiative put on the ballot to have the citizens vote whether they wanted a full-time paid department or they wanted to continue to let the volunteers service the city. And the city overwhelmingly voted to continue with the volunteers, which caused the city to shut down their paid fire department. So that was quite a heated, uh, heated battle. I think it, it changed the attitude of the, of the fire department. And um, I think they've worked, they've gotten along very, very well ever since. But it, <clears throat> it was just a little contest that had to play out. Well, the, the thing that probably built the fire department the fastest was the dispute between the city and the volunteers because when that occurred, the volunteers had to go to the port and say, we don't have any equipment because the city won't let us take it out of the city. So that's when the port said, well, we'll buy you equipment. Um, the fire department really grew. I mean, she took a big jump forward when, uh, when we started contracting with the port and they started buying equipment. The unique thing about the fire department is the fire department uh, although it is the city's fire department, it is also the port's fire department. The fire department is a private, not-for-profit, 501c3 corporation um, that by the uh, city charter is the only one that can be their fire department. And by the uniqueness of it, um, the city has the fire department and the size of the fire department because they only pay for one half of the fire department. The other half of the fire department is um, paid for by the Canaveral Port Authority. Uh, there's two stations, one at the port and one at the city. The unique thing also about this department is uh, we are a training center and we are the uh, training center for Brevard Community College uh, fire standards. The city sets uh, the level of service and the port sets the level of service um, that they want and the citizens vote whether or not to accept that level of service because obviously they have to pay more for a certain level of service. It is um, a very unique situation, probably the only arrangement like this uh, for sure in the state of Florida. I was also in charge of planning and zoning. Joined the planning and zoning board. I was on the planning and zoning board, yes. I was on the planning and zoning board for about five years. I eventually got involved in city politics on the Planning and Zoning Board. So I got on the Planning and Zoning Board immediately after graduating from college. I could tell that things had gone up in a hurry and without a whole lot of thought um, during that boom time and we are still dealing with some of that as, as we move forward as a city. When I got here in uh, 73, the Planning and Zoning Board was already in existence for about 10 years. And uh, they were ably led. In fact, in a book I wrote about lessons learned in planning and zoning, I went back and researched some of those people. They were very able men they, uh, and women, and they uh, had the good of the city at heart. So they were trying to just simply get the city laid out, get its development uh, under control by uh, lot regulations. And that was pretty much all they could accomplish. They had a lot on their plate. And then uh, people like me came along in a second wave. And uh, then we started uh, looking at uh, density and uh, lot setbacks. The city used to have no regulation about how its appearance, how to manage its appearance. Refrigerators, dead couches, abandoned cars had to go. So we put into place regulations that people had to clean their lots up. Well, those people who were very slow had to come before a code enforcement board. Well, we didn't used to have a code enforcement board, so we built one and gave it teeth. That's been a hard process over the years, and that's been pretty much the way we have made our city look better and instituted the, first, the state's very first comprehensive land use plan. We were the guinea pig. 
They gave us a grant. We took the money and built a plan, and uh, we were the first comp plan in the state of Florida. We had an average population of about 5,200 people. Our average population today is over 10,000. The Planning and Zoning Board's job is to uh, plan for the growth and development, health, welfare of the community. And so we said we need better streets, we need uh, better density regulations, and somebody asked us one time, how did you guys keep commercial development off the seashores and the river uh, line? And I replied that it was a combination of luck and pluck because the, the plucky part is we just simply said no to the people that came in and wanted to rezone for commercial on the uh, shorelines. And the luck part was to uh, encourage the community and uh, get it to buy into a height and density set of regulations that uh, just made us uh, less uh, intensely developed. I came here in 1970 from Miami and the first thing that I realized is that this area was trying to be like Miami with a million people in it and I didn't like that. And I remembered how when I lived in Miami how they did it how they did it against what the people wanted. So I came here and the first thing I did was, was go to a council meeting to see who was doing it. And, and, and of course they were all in there saying, oh, the more people, more businesses, and the more people we can get here, the better. And it's not easy to stand up and say the opposite. And you had different factions on the city council. You had some people, well, that wanted to control the growth and have quality growth, and you have others that wanted no growth. You know, leave it alone, I don't want it to change at all. And the average person in, in Cape Canaveral said, well, I like to keep it as pristine as we can. And that, 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 that attitude prevailed. The big issue, when I got on the city council, the big issue was zoning. We have had, I have had more fights with developers than my husband has, because just about the time he got off of the city council, I got on it, and I was the one from 1972 on for many years. We fought with the developers. Uh, my wife and I are proud of the part we played, because you know, money talks, and money talks awfully loud. And so often money, money interests prevail. When the town first started, uh, you had the business people, people who owned the trailer parks and the, uh, the other businesses around town, the real estate. And then you had the people who just wanted to come here and live and fish and breathe fresh air and not be bothered. Well, those two entities clashed. And uh, the business entity wanted uh, 80 units per acre so that they'd maximize their uh, property uh, development. There were almost fisticuffs in the council meeting. And uh, we used to have a deputy sheriff, uh, an armed guard standing in the council chamber to keep order uh, if necessary. And, and there are people who won't speak to each other to this day. But there was a time during the density debate that uh, the first thing you did when you talked to your neighbor was you kind of sound them out on which side they were on before you continued to talk because you could get in trouble and then pretty soon you were in an argument. So it was a troubled time for about five years. I mean, there was a big fight over the years on density. How many units per acre could be built in the city? And I mean, that, that fight ruined a lot of friendships. People were getting to the point where they, they wanted to preserve what we had. Leo and Mrs. Filkins did battle. I mean, they battled and it was, it was on a number of things. She was not hesitant to speak out. She had an opinion, and you're gonna hear it. And um, she carried a lot of weight because she had the press behind her, and uh, they liked her because she was verbose, you know? She could say things. You know? And so I started opening my mouth, saying, why are you doing that? It'll cost money, and, and uh, the traffic will be terrible on A1A, and so forth, and they, um, they were kind of hostile. And then I'd find out that right here, my neighbors were all on my side. They said, yeah, we don't want all that. 
So then I formed the Cape Canaveral Citizens Association. See, I started right away when I got here because I had just come from South Florida and I knew how they did it. I knew that they changed zoning and they did it without you know, having the people know that they were doing it. When something was coming up in the council that was, that it was important that they be there, I would call one and they'd call others. And so we, you know, in time, were feared almost by the councils. I used to write letters to the editor and I knew that everybody read them here because everybody reads those. And I got to know people in the newspaper and gradually things began to change. Several of the citizens um, got together and, and initiated a uh, uh, referendum petition uh, to uh, limit the uh, building height and the zoning density. The, the referendum passed uh, and as to be expected when it did by the you know, one of the prime developers uh, then took the case to court through the city uh, in court and the, the court overthrew the petition uh, saying that you could not uh, uh, zoned by referendum, and at that time, that was the law of the land. At that time, all over the United States, developers were in the ascendancy, and they said it was illegal to have people vote on zoning, if you can imagine. So we went, uh, this wonderful attorney, Pierce Wood, took us all, we went to the Florida Supreme Court, and then we went to a federal court in Atlanta, and we won. The Cape Canaveral Citizens Association actually was the determiner of what you see today. And a lot of people still think that you can't have citizens vote on zoning. Well, we did, and that's why we are the city we are today. Fortunately, long before me, the, the residents had the wisdom to put a, a height of 45 feet in the community and that was passed by referendum, which is by voters. And the important thing there is, is that uh, individuals or a new council cannot change it without going back to the voters for their opinion. At least we've accepted that. Also, they uh, very wisely so many years decided it was a living community and not a business community. And they have restricted the zoning along the ocean, all residential, R3, which means it's residential. It can be one, two, three floors, but it is residential. No business along the entire ocean. Somewhat different than the neighboring cities, the same way with the uh, river. Two months ago, I went to a council meeting and Rocky Randalls made, he said the nicest thing about me. And I, it was like a thank you, because nobody had ever said that. I'd always felt I was hated. And he just said, the reason Cape Canaveral is the way it is is Helen Philkins. And I thought, cow, this is more, maybe I'm dying or something. <laughs> They're trying to be nice. So the one thing I've found out in politics, and that is if you want something, you better bring in at least 15 people and then they listen. Leo Collins is what, wife, she, volunteers to start a library. I think it was Canaveral Boulevard. It was just a small little library. Actually, it's like a, a strip mall, but it's all condos in there, apartments at that time. And it was a very small library. We moved the library, Shuford Mills offered us a location. We went from just a little, little bit of, what you might call a hole in a wall, to real nice digs, you might say, for our library. So Another, uh, highlight was when we decided to uh, build and open our own library. See, we did, our, we did this library ourselves. It's now a part of the county what library system. Was going to uh, delete the Cape Canaveral Library, the Meadow Lane Library, and the Stone Library. We urged the citizens to vote a referendum tax to build, operate, and maintain our own library. And the people voted for it. The land where the, where the library is today was owned by uh, Florida Power and Light. They were going to put a, a substation here. We prevailed on them to sell it to the city. I think we paid $95,000 for the whole block. Uh, we got into this uh, hassle with the library and 
said, let's put the library there. And the library was a, a big item that they were pushing for. And of course, you know, jointly with the, the county, they developed the library that we're sitting in right now. Uh, the books are useful, but the waiting line is now for use of the computers. We also, at that time, uh, got the uh, citizens to vote for a beautification tax, which was a, a half mill tax at the time, recognizing that we, wanted, we were living here and we wanted the city to, to look, look good. <laughs> no recreation. <laughs> No, they didn't have any recreation. A lot of people had boats, so, I mean, that was great. That was good recreation. Well, we had a boat, and uh, we did some fishing in the river and, and the ocean. Future wife was <laughs> chairman of the recreation board. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I did was my recreation board, which was started in 63, of them, or maybe 64, we got started a little league program for the boys. They played ball. We had a, uh, a city ballpark which was donated to Atlanta. It was donated by uh, Brozier. It was another piece of property I believe that the county had picked up for defaulted taxes and deeded it to the city. So then we ended up having two whole city blocks for recreation, uh, mostly ball fields. I got uh, involved with uh, city recreation at first with Nancy Hansen, whom my rec development rec complex is named after. She lived next door to me. She said, Lamar, you need to come down and help us. So I did. We were on the rec complex together and we built that with uh, the help of a lot of other great people in the town, Leo and Harry Rame and Dick Thurm and Ann Thurm and all those great people. We looked around and decided that uh, the children needed uh, good uh, facilities and our grown-ups needed good recreation facilities, so. The land where the uh, recreation complex is now was owned by the county. The county had, had gotten it for uh, taxes de de default, deeded to the city. We passed a referendum to build the handball courts in the rec center. My company, Architect Engineering Company, designed some of the features of that as a pro bono uh, type of uh, deal. We had a tiny little trailer before. It was one of those ones like when the banks are getting ready to get built, they have the little trailers, three rooms, that's what we had. We had all our dance classes, we had everything in that little trailer. And then um, in 1975, they built the recreation center here. There were two racquetball courts, uh, the five tennis courts and 12 shuffleboard courts and the tiny little building, and, uh, and it was fine. But then as the community grew, the need for a new recreation building grew. They built two more racquetball courts because at that time, that was, racquetball was sweeping the country. Everybody wanted to play. And then we added a youth center in 1986 where the ball fields are. So now we have a whole youth center. Buzz Pestos, who's our councilman, um, he works for the Space Center and they were getting rid of a double wide module and he thought it would be a really good idea for us to take it. It was free. They worked. We had a lot of volunteers that worked. Most of our council people did. Um, we had some volunteers, a recreation board, everybody pitched in to, to get it up to par so we could open up and have a youth center. And it was just a really nice place, just a drop-in center for the kids to have something to do. It's like ages 10 to 15 the age where they can get in a lot of trouble when the parents are working and they need somewhere to go, a safe place, and so that's how we built the youth center. I stumbled upon this recreation, actually I stumbled upon Cape Canaveral, and then stumbled upon the recreation department and had the pleasure of meeting Nancy Hansen, who at the time, ironically, was looking for a recreation coordinator and an athletic coordinator. So it, it was something that seemed meant to be. Seemingly being groomed to take over the department maybe when Nancy retired, um, but obviously that time came uh, quicker than we had anticipated and um, I was kind of I was kind of put in the position to take over as director and those were some some very large shoes to fill um, being the tenure that Nancy had with the department. Nancy was was a fantastic person to work for. I, I, I just I, I 
I loved it and she was, she was really different from where I had come from. Um, where I had come from being such a larger city and uh, the chain of command uh, that you had to, to work through and, and a lot of uh, politics and red tape, those things changed and, and we virtually shared an office together. Um, she gave me pretty much free run to, to do whatever I thought needed to be done to enhance the city and the visions that I had were, were, were just following in her footsteps, following through with what her visions were and then maybe taking it to the next level and enhancing them. The city of Cape Canaveral has been fortunate to have a cast of outstanding people. The interviews here represent a small portion of the many residents who have made a difference in this community. For all those individuals that have served or who are serving in city government, we would like to recognize you and thank you for your community support. The city of Cape Canaveral is exploring ways to shape its near future. The residents and city officials are discussing in an open format the future of this small community. These envisioning meetings are a great way to meet your elected officials and take an active role in the future of the city of Cape Canaveral. To learn more about your community, visit our website at www.cityofcapecanaveral.org. The city of Cape Canaveral, where we live with the sun, space, sea, every day. Cape Canaveral is a magic name. It's a name that's over 500 years old. The Spaniards gave us the name, the Cape of Cambrakes. We've always been a jumping off place for ex exploration, for opening the new world, the Spaniards navigation point, and we're still a jumping off place for exploration and new worlds. The place grew up too fast for me. If I had my way, it would have never grown up. I just wonder, you know, why everything had to change. So I think that was the general feeling here of people in Cape Canaveral, that they were part of making history. And it just is, was wonderful. It's just a nice place to live. It's just a, a lovely little city. Really a great place to live. I'm, I'm honored to be here. It's just, it's a great little city. That's all it is. It's not a fancy place. It, it didn't start out that way and it never will be that way. It's just a place for people to live and let live. A lot of the people uh, want to have it just the way it is now, basically a, a place to live as opposed to a tourist attraction. I thought the city fathers were very sightful, had a lot of foresight in limiting the, the condos on the beach and that and the development in that respect. So thankful to them for doing that for us. We don't have too much to regret the time that we served in office in the city of Cape Canaveral. But we're mindful of the fact that it, it can change at any time. <laughs> it can change with the council members. I'm proud of Cape Canaveral, I'm proud to have served here. And the city was very, very well organized. Politically, I think we've done wonderful. I think the politicians did a great job here in the city. And I like Cape Canaveral the way it is, and so does everybody else. And they really do. We lived in a safe community, easy access uh, from our front door to the ocean, and it's just, just a wonderful place to live in. I mean, the city is unusual in the sense that there aren't, it isn't like Cocoa Beach, and it isn't like the rest of South Florida. Well, I have traveled everywhere and done about everything, but the friendliest place in the whole world is Cape Canaveral. If you go away, which Howard and I used to do, travel, and you come back and you cross the rivers, you think, why did I ever go away? If I had to do it over again, I wouldn't change any part of it. I don't look back and say, well, I wish we had done this or that or the other. I think that uh, we've done pretty well.